Okay, I think we've got a good group in now. So uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's uh, ESRI Shared Island Unit uh, webinar. Um, I think uh, re regular uh, whatever viewers or whatever will know that uh, over the last couple of years, the ESRI has been doing a, a considerable amount of work with the, the Shared Island Unit in the Department of Taoiseach, uh, looking at various all island uh, issues. Uh, very often uh, with these research projects, the, the, the goal is to sort of look at areas uh, whereby enhanced sort of cooperation on the island of Ireland uh, could yield benefits uh, for the citizens north and south. And uh, this morning's webinar and, and report, which we're launching on renewable energy, is very much uh, in, in that sort of spirit. Um, it was an ideal topic uh, for us to investigate on the, the, the Shared Island program. Uh, again, as all of you will know, uh, through the single electricity market, there's already a, a strong degree of collaboration on the island uh, in this area. Uh, and of course, as is often said, when it comes to issues of climate, uh, borders are, are, are in a sense sort of meaningless anyway. Uh, so it makes an awful lot of sense that we'd be looking at, at the potential for collaboration. So the way we're going to uh, run things, uh, in a moment, my colleague uh, Niall Farrell will give you the uh, the details of the, the research study uh, that we're launching today. Uh, then after that, delighted to say Derek Scully from Energia uh, will join us and will give us sort of some uh, observations and a response to the report. Uh, and then we should have a little bit of time um, after all that for some Q&A. Uh, so if people, if uh, some topics, questions strike you during the course of the discussion, uh, feel free to submit uh, questions through the Q&A function and I'll do my best uh, to uh, pass them on to Niall and Marin Lynch will hopefully join us as well and Derek, you're very welcome to join that uh, discussion too. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Niall Farrell, and I presume you're going to share some slides, Niall. Uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you everybody for joining us. So this piece of work funded by the Shared Island Unit is discussing all-Ireland coordination of energy infrastructure and renewable energy supports. Um, this is work that's been carried out uh, with uh, colleagues Colin Menton, Gennaro Longoria and Warren Lynch. So just by way of introduction, I suppose... Um, Many of you who will be familiar with the energy market in Ireland will know that we have a single electricity market. So it's governed on an all island basis. The general planning and development of the infrastructure is, is an all, all island uh, contingency, and it makes a lot of sense. We have one contiguous uh, island, which uh, is a um, geographically isolated uh, entity. So therefore, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to coordinate uh, the planning and operation of, of the infrastructure in that context. Uh, one element that is perhaps not, not um, coordinated, but has moved in tandem in recent times, has been a renewable energy targets. And these are sort of jurisdiction specific. What we wanted to look at in this paper was to see, well, um, this sort of coordination, and if this continues going forward, what is the benefit of this? And if there was a divergence uh, in targets, uh, what would this mean for maybe the cost and operation of the system, which uh, the other elements uh, tend to, tend to uh, work, work, work uh, 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 in one unit? Um, when we first considered this piece of uh, research, it was a case where Ireland had its 80%, up to 80% target, and in Northern Ireland, uh, it was around 70% was the target, but this was recently up, updated to 80% in the last uh, year or so. So I suppose in that context, what we're looking at here is, well, what is the benefit of this continued alignment of policy costs? And is there a case where maybe if there was misalignment, would it sort of set us on a suboptimal trajectory uh, in the longer term? And we want to maybe look at these, at these factors. So the research that we look at maybe can be broken down into three elements. The first is maybe just the alignment of the targets. Um, what, how does that help us in terms of coordination of infrastructure development, maybe the cost of the system as a whole? Secondly, we want to look at maybe another piece of um, all island uh, infrastructure, and that's the north-south interconnector. We want to quantify the benefit of this and how this maybe fits in in terms of facilitating a uh, cost-effective deployment of renewables uh, on, the, uh, on the island. And then finally, we want to look at maybe uh, an element, what, what we term effort sharing. And what we're looking at here is in many international agreements, we have situations where 
across the different uh, jurisdictions, you might want to uh, share the effort. And maybe not, if, if for example, you have an 80% target in one jurisdiction and 80% target in another jurisdiction, it may be more cost effective maybe to sort of do a bit of horse trade in the background and decide that more of this maybe takes place in one jurisdiction than another. And there's a bit of sort of negotiation around that. And this makes a lot of sense, maybe from a more theoretical perspective. Uh, if we have, um, it might, might be the most efficient way to maybe allocate that. And we want to see, is that the case? And are we far away from maybe this theoretical optimal? And is there maybe scope for further uh, efficiencies on the island? So before we get into the actual analysis, um, just to maybe some previous work and some literature to try and see where does this fit into maybe work that's been done in the past? One element of this piece of research is that it's a cross-jurisdictional analysis. So it's basically, we're looking at uh, a situation where we have maybe one market, but we have two sort of jurisdictions within that market. And this is something which has been looked at in an international context. We have a lot of American markets, for example, where it maybe crosses many states and there's, 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 there's maybe different jurisdictions within that. So the results of this paper can be interesting for outside of Ireland in that context. In an Irish context, um, some papers have been carried out to look at look at research in this in this uh, regard. One paper by John Curtis and and colleagues uh, in Ireland looked at maybe perhaps the potential imposition of the carbon price floor in Northern Ireland, how this would affect maybe um, the renewables and and changes of of welfare uh, across the island. Uh, of course, that uh, wasn't brought in, uh, but it was looked at. The scenario was was explored as to whether if this this situation that was being brought in in Great Britain would have, would have been transferred to Northern Ireland. We have a similar sort of cross-jurisdictional uh, focus, but we're looking at maybe re renewable energy targets and th the implications of perhaps misalignment uh, or, or unaligned targets in that, that regard. Secondly, we want to look at uh, renewable energy deployment and the impact this may have on electricity prices and maybe the cost, I suppose, more generally uh, in terms of uh, the operation of the system. Some work has been done looking at maybe focusing on operational costs, where perhaps we're looking at you bring in renewable renewables, and then at each moment in time, the cost of generation maybe perhaps has this uh, reduction, or in certain certain moments of high wind, and that's essentially the merit order effect. This paper considers those effects, but it also considers maybe the long term investment costs, and so we're looking at maybe the longer term trajectory of not just the operational costs, but the investment costs and the operational costs. A final piece that we sort of fit into is maybe looking at the cost of subsidies and price support. So work that I've done with colleagues in, here at, at the Institute and work that's been done in other jurisdictions such as Germany and, and Italy have explored, uh, if we have more renewables on the system, what does that mean for maybe prices, but what does it also mean for, for uh, policy costs? Well, in this paper, we don't explore this explicitly, but we do explore the impacts on prices, and then we can say something as to how this may uh, influence uh, future policy costs, and we'll discuss that at the end as well. Okay, so that's maybe just a bit, bit of context. Um, the next step then is to look at well, what, are, what is the methodology uh, of our paper, and it's basically works on this uh, engine model that we have here. Uh, in the SRI, and it's basically an electricity network generation and investment model. And uh, the way I like to think of it is, uh, if you look at the, I suppose the map on the right, where we have our, the island of Ireland, and we have the transmission network. It sort of models that transmission network essentially, and at each node, at each point on the network, we ha we have uh, data on the demand at that node, and we have data on perhaps the, the, the supply at each node, and also uh, information when it comes to renewables as well. Uh, we consider a policy scenario uh, of looking at modeling to 2030, so it's aligned and it's sort of in tandem with, with the targets that we're looking at. And we model the optimal infrastructure and generation investment to meet a, policy, a given policy objective. And we look at a num number of scenarios. So if I was to break down maybe the modeling procedure into inputs, um, the box of the model and then the outputs, the inputs then is where we have the existing system infrastructure, like, like what you see maybe on the right-hand side, the demand profile at each node, the availability of wind and solar at each node, and then we have financial data in terms of what are the investment costs if we want to maybe roll out more renewables, and what are the operational costs of new and existing generators. That then goes into the engine model, 
The engine model then considers, well, what scenarios are we going to look at, such as renewable energy target scenarios, whether the north-south interconnector is operational. There are the sort of scenarios we explore in this model. We look at we look at scenarios where we have unaligned targets. So basically, 70% uh, 2030 target in, in Northern Ireland and an 80% target in Ireland. And then we look at the recently updated target to 80% Northern Ireland first in, uh, with the 80% in Ireland, and that's our, our aligned target. And then we look at those scenarios with and without a north side interconnector. And then we also look at the scenario where we have maybe one island of Ireland, 80% target to see those effort sharing is something worth, worth pursuing. Then the outputs, uh, I just moved this out of the way. Uh, so the outputs then would be uh, essentially what's the cost of operation uh, in the system. So we have total system costs. What are the investments? What's the changes in infrastructure uh, as a result of maybe these scenarios? What are the prices? What, what is the average price of generate of electricity uh, under that scenario? And then one thing we sort of explore is uh, what will be the renewable energy subsidy requirement, what we sort of term as the viability gap. So if you think about it, the prices are a certain level. And if we want to incentivize renewables, well, up, and, up until very re up until uh, recent times, we want to consider a subsidy, a price support in there, and in the foreseeable future, we'll need that as well. Um, the, the viability gap then is the difference between the prices and the, the cost of the operation, and that's the, for viability, and, and the that difference we term the viability gap. Okay, so the results here, I'll, what I'll do is I'll present maybe perhaps uh, the headline results, and that, that so that would be perhaps the more interesting results. The first thing we look at in the presentation is maybe looking at the impact of the north-south interconnector before we consider um, bringing on this alignment of targets. So basically, we want to isolate the impact of the north-south interconnector. So the first thing that I think is quite striking when we look at the north-south interconnector is that we have a, an increase in generation capacity. So the system solves or the model solves for the optimal allocation of generation assets across the island. One interesting thing we find is that there is an increase in generation, a shift away from the focus in Ireland towards Northern Ireland. And perhaps this takes account of the fact that um, we have greater connection between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland and facilitated by the North South Interconnector. And that means with greater lo location of uh, generation in Northern Ireland. Why was it a greater emphasis in Ireland? Well, this is perhaps reflects the fact that there's perhaps more demand uh, in Ireland and perhaps in Northern Ireland, and it made sense to maybe perhaps locate a greater share of, of generation in, in Ireland. Um, but this sort of raises some interesting um, discussions, and perhaps there are maybe industrial policy and regional development implications, given that the Northern Irish economy is perhaps smaller than the Irish economy, and putting in place this infrastructure and facilitating this, uh, this, this infrastructure to integrate the All-Ireland system uh, perhaps can help can perhaps potentially have regional development implications uh, for Northern Ireland. Perhaps something to discuss in the uh, in the uh, in the discussion. The second thing then is that there's a reduced requirement for storage um, going forward in Northern Ireland if we have the North Southern connector in place. And this makes a lot of sense in that the transmission infrastructure is a substitute for storage. Um, we can we no longer need storage located in Northern Ireland, we can we can now have maybe perhaps more generation locally, and we have greater uh, transmission infrastructure, and we can use that instead of storage uh, in Northern Ireland to uh, to facilitate um, uh, the transmission of gener of electricity from the point of generation to the point of use. Okay, so this, okay, so that's basically, um, in summary, the total uh, amount of, of investment that's on the island. So we see that in total, we have a greater amount in Northern Ireland, which reflects the generational investment, uh, less storage investment in Northern Ireland. And we also have some additional network investment in Ireland to facilitate the integration of the North Side Interconnector. So the second piece of analysis then is looking at, we're now looking, shifting over to look at uh, policy alignment that is increasing renewables targets from 70% in Northern Ireland to 80%, and that's aligned with the 80% target in Ireland. First of all, we'll explore this without the North-South Interconnector, and just to see some headline uh, findings from that. First thing is with the alignment, and this sort of makes a lot of sense, uh, is that we are increasing our targets, so therefore we're going to increase 
generation in Northern Ireland. And that's because of the target. So we have an increase about 11% of renewables in uh, Northern Ireland, of generation Northern Ireland, uh, which is due to the renewables target. An interesting factor here, though, is that we have a reduction in storage in Northern Ireland and we have an increase in storage uh, in Ireland uh, to facilitate this. This sort of sort of reflects a changing pattern of absorption of electricity on the island to accommodate this alignment of targets. What's essentially happening uh, from the model is that we have greater generation in Northern Ireland. We no longer need this storage in Northern Ireland because we have this added generation. We have to send, send it to, to Ireland. And when we send it to Ireland, um, that doesn't necessarily get used instantaneously, and therefore it gets, it gets stored. Uh, uh, for use at the time that it's required. This is essentially what uh, we discussed already, but um, the additional excess that's generated in Northern Ireland tends to be absorbed uh, in Ireland, and perhaps this is reflective of the greater demand in general that's, uh, that, that's, that's uh, located in, in Ireland. The third part then is to look at the north-south interconnector when we have policy alignment. So basically, again, this is a scenario where we are increasing uh, generation in Ireland from 70% to 80% renewables. We still have 80% in Ireland, so we have the line targets, and now the interconnector uh, is operational. Again, we have the situation where we've added storage uh, in Ireland, um, but uh, we have less sort of network investment. And um, I, think the, I think the main policy take-home message here is that we have uh, the storage requirement is perhaps a no regrets policy uh, in, in Ireland. Whether we have uh, the north south interconnector operational or not, additional storage is perhaps uh, a policy that, that makes a lot of sense in an Irish context. And this is something which comes out when we have the aligned targets and is not necessarily clear when we have the unaligned targets. And if you think about it in a perspective that we're perhaps going to move to 80%, 90%, and one would up to net, net zero eventually, this storage will be required eventually. So perhaps it's, it's, a, it's setting us on that trajectory at an earlier stage and perhaps is, is more, it's more efficient in, in the longer term. So the fourth section of our results is to look at this effort sharing scenario. So essentially what we're looking at here is a scenario where we have separate 80% targets in Ireland and Northern Ireland. I would compare this to an island-wide 80% target. And this is perhaps motivated by, or it's inspired by what we see internationally, maybe starting with the Kyoto Protocol, where we have this sort of effort sharing idea. It doesn't matter where, uh, uh, where um, carbon emissions are, are taken out of the system, because you know, carbon emissions are, are climate change is a global phenomenon, but it makes sense to reduce the effort where it's most efficient. And that's sort of the, the motivation for this. And what we want to see is, are we far away from the theoretical optimal in our scenario? For example, could it be a scenario where there's a lot of wind on the West Coast and it would make a lot of sense maybe to put all the wind along there and perhaps uh, maybe do some sort of uh, trading in the background to uh, make sure that we have um, everybody sort of meets their targets, but the effort is allocated in the most efficient way. This table sort of summarizes then the cost relative to the unaligned scenario uh, of these various different scenarios where we have individual or effort sharing uh, ways of achieving our 80% target and whether or not the north side interconnector is optimal. There's two main points that I would like to take from this. First of all, the additional cost is not, is, is not hugely great and we're not too far off the most efficient effort sharing outcome if we have the North South interconnector in place. So basically, uh, we're not leaving a lot of efficiencies on the table by having separate targets on the island. This is even less so if we have the North South interconnector in place. In fact, it's probably we're probably better off having the North South interconnector than having an effort sharing uh, system in, on the island. So the North South interconnector is very important for achieving uh, efficient allocation of costs uh, on the island. The final section then is something that, given these findings of the model, uh, what are the implications for electricity prices? And that's one of the outputs of the model. And then what are the implications then for policy costs uh, going forward? 
one thing just I suppose to bear in mind here is that the model itself it, it solves what are known as locational marginal prices and these are sort of something that that's we see in maybe um, different markets in, in the US, for example, but we don't have it in Ireland. But essentially what it means is it's the price or the marginal cost of generation at a given point in the system. And we can sort of use those to get a feel for what is the cost of, of operation in Ireland versus Northern Ireland. And then we can sort of average them out to get a, a sense of what are the changes in, in the system marginal prices at, at a, an aggregate level. So at an aggregate level, we could say prices would fall by maybe around four and a half percent as a result of the Northern Ireland uh, uh, alignment with, 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 with Irish policy. So the increase in their ambition when it comes to renewable energy targets. So these are, as we have an all island system, these are prices that will, will be felt across the island. And the, the change in, in, in marginal prices uh, is pretty uniform across between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And this sort of holds uh, whether or not the, the interconnector uh, is in place. The final piece of analysis then is to consider well, what does this mean uh, for policy costs? So as we said before, uh, renewables have to be deployed to meet our targets. And um, if the cost of deployment is greater than the price, well, then we need a price support. The cost of that price support is the difference between the, the price of the system and then the, the cost of, of to make to make to make it worth their while. If fuel prices are low, well then that's going to be there's going to be a cost because the difference between the fuel the electricity price and the price electricity price is going to be less than the uh, that than, than the cost of deployment. And this electricity price is going to be a little bit lower because we have this uh, reduces reduction in prices. So if fuel prices are low, there might be a slight increase for the requirement for renewable energy price supports. Now, one thing to bear in mind that research that has been carried out in the past and by colleagues in the ESRI has, and in other contexts as well, has found that this merit order effect has outweighed the, um, the subsidy requirements. So uh, one would hope that that would, that would continue into the future. If fuel prices are high, like what we've seen in the recent past, um, the cost essentially would depend on the policy support in place. So in Ireland, for example, we have the, we have uh, renewables that are supported by the refit scheme and the renewable, renewable energy support scheme. Those under the renewable energy support scheme, if the electricity price goes above a pre-agreed price that's required uh, for viability, well, then that difference is given back to, to the consumer. And we'll see that in our PSO, those who are listening from Ireland, we'll see that in their PSO uh, or in their electricity bill with uh, through their PSO levy uh, in, in the next year or so. Um, so that means that if the, the conclusion there of the increased uh, subsidy requirement will not hold in Ireland under the Renewable, renewable Energy Support Scheme, uh, any future deployment under that scheme will not incur this additional cost. In Northern Ireland, uh, the last time I checked, uh, there's still debate as to whether it's a what sort of policy we put in place. If a system similar to the renewable energy support scheme is put in place where the generators have to give back any excess back to the consumer, well, then this would hold also. So that, that would be a useful uh, point to take into, into account. So just to summarize maybe some of the main policy conclusions, uh, additional storage in Ireland is perhaps a no regrets policy. It helps to absorb the additional renewables on the island with or without an interconnector in place. One thing to take into account as well, now that we have this alignment of policies, it sort of, it maybe sets us closer to a longer term trajectory that might, might be useful. For example, if we had the 70, 80 uh, policy, it might be a case that we might've had more storage in Northern Ireland than perhaps uh, we would have, would have been optimal uh, post 2030. Um, Increased renewables puts downward pressure on prices. Um, this will benefit consumers across the island. And the design of the, the policy that's in place will be very important when it comes to how this affects uh, the final cost to consumers. Um, and finally, the system is close to a theoretical optimum in terms of efficiency. So essentially, we explored this theoretical effort sharing system. And we're very close to that uh, with our current system. And the North Side Interconnector is perhaps the most important piece of inf infrastructure to get us as close as we can. Uh, to that efficiency. So I'll leave it there and I'll pass it on to Derek for uh, his comments. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Niall. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Derek Scully. I'm Head of Corporate Affairs at Energia Group. And I'm delighted to be here today to uh, to join this session and to comment on what is, I think, it's 
an important and interesting paper uh, in terms of some of the the areas that it is it has explored. Uh, and pro- possibly my comments today will reflect uh, what perhaps the paper didn't set out uh, to look at, um, but what is implied by it. Uh, and in that, what I want to do is is start probably taking the main themes of the paper, looking at that alignment and cooperation piece, uh, have a look then maybe at some of the conclusions of some of the results around the storage and the investment, the implications of, of it. And then finally, just on the prices and, and the support scheme areas. So I don't have slides. Uh, I just thought uh, in the interest of a, a, a discussion, hopefully uh, I'll run through these fairly quickly. Uh, just for those, again, who are unaware of Energia Group, uh, we are an all island utility uh, who have invested about a billion euros in Ireland to date in thermal generation, renewable generation. We also have about 800,000 customers. We were the first uh, and we are the largest supplier of customers in Northern Ireland. Uh, And for about the last 20 years, we've been supplying commercial customers, more recently domestic customers in Ireland. So all of this uh, research certainly uh, resonates with us and with some of the decisions that we have to make on a daily basis. But if we take the starting point of this paper uh, and, and of all of this research as being, I suppose, what we've all perhaps at this stage taken for granted as the single electricity market, that underpins not only the results in this paper, but largely the success within the electricity market across the island state. This was a game changer in terms of international cooperation in energy markets. And while other countries have caught up, and it was the model in some ways for the European Union when they started to look at the third package and cooperation of of across countries and their electricity system, it is something, I think, which we are at risk of taking for granted, but as I'll get on to, I think underpins much of the results that are there today in this paper. So relatively speaking, we're a small system. Um, unfortunately, many of the investments required in this transition are at the margins. Um, and it means we require analysis and research like this to underpin what we know. There, there really isn't uh, much scope to get things wrong in a system like this, where they are large, long-term, lumpy investments typically uh, that are that are required. Increasingly, though, more distributed generation, albeit with still very significant amounts of uh, investment required to facilitate those. So at a high level, to me, what I've sort of taken from this paper is that renewable electricity brings down wholesale prices. The north-south interconnector improves efficiency of that single electricity market and alignment on policy brings about further benefit. That all seems quite intuitive when you understand the single electricity market was set up as an unconstrained system uh, to achieve uh, energy, uh, to the delivery of energy across the island. So the alignment then of policy objectives or climate targets uh, is not new either. So up to 2020, both Northern Ireland and Ireland had effectively a 40% renewable electricity target, both achieved or almost achieved, depending on which numbers you look at, and now both have an 80% target for 2030. And on the overall climate targets, it's again, not really a surprise in that these have been driven by international agreements and ultimately by science. And it is going to result in changes when you talk about them. In simple terms, don't seem all that significant. So net zero by 2050, it's an objective not just shared by Ireland and Northern Ireland, but by many countries at this stage around the world. But by 2030, there is the Irish government have committed to a 51% reduction in overall uh, carbon emission. And That is relative to 2018. Similar, albeit uh, slightly easier target, perhaps, is 
Northern Ireland's target of 56%, which is set relative to 1990. Now, talking about having our emissions in all energy, not just electricity, uh, is very significant. What will underpin this will be the transition in electricity. And while there is policies now and plans to help achieve all of this, it cannot, its delivery cannot be taken for granted. And if we look even at a high level at what is installed in renewable electricity across the island state, there's about 6,000 megawatts of onshore wind. The achievement of policies that have been set out will require approximately 12,000 additional megawatts of wind by 2030 and at least 5,000 megawatts of solar. That is a scale which of investment uh, that is just unprecedented in the island. And the Irish government target for 2,000 megawatts of new gas fire generation is also uh, approximately the amount that's been delivered in the last 20 years. So the challenges are huge, but also so are the opportunities. And in some ways, this, this is all inevitable in terms of the pathway we need to get on to achieve net zero by 2050. Key to this, and as the papers outlined, is going to be the role of storage. Storage isn't easy. There's not an awful lot of it on the island. But if we step back just from the practicalities for, of it for a moment, there's going to be... The higher the target on renewable electricity, the more storage that's required. And an interesting, I think, result in the paper, certainly for those who are looking at investments at the moment, is that sub the confirmation of that substitutability between storage and transmission. The transmission system across the island requires a very significant amount of investment. That investment is not just required to enable the transition, that investment is required to keep pace with the investment that has happened to date. Certainly on projects that exist in Northern Ireland, uh, we have some where it's almost 20% of the electricity those projects are capable of producing is lost every year because of the dispatch down of, of their output. So can storage play a role? It's, it's, it's interesting, I think, as a result that yes, it can, and that it is a substitute for perhaps much needed investment. Although it does beg the question as to whether this treats a symptom uh, as opposed to the cause in, in terms of the problem here. And again, not really a surprise then that in an unconstrained market, the addition of the north-south interconnector would help increase efficiency uh, and to drive a better result. So I can't disagree with the finding that storage is a no regrets option. Uh, it is undoubtedly going to be required to a very significant degree. But the reality, I think, on the ground today is that there are, and obviously the authors of the paper note this, there are, uh, in their own analysis, capacity and ancillary service revenues, additional revenue streams outside of the market have not been looked at. But really, I don't think that would make a significant impact on the paper is that those, those signals clearly aren't there today. So while we don't have a central planner model, and perhaps this, the model that the, 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 the authors have, have adopted here is, assumes that role, I think we welcome the long-term perspective that it brings to this, it is necessary that we look to the market to deliver it. And in doing so, it's important the policymakers involve the market in designing the schemes that are required to bring about these outcomes. So we need more storage. Uh, I, I think we need then to start a discussion around what the market requires to deliver that amount of storage. I think in terms of a future, future research question, perhaps coming out of this paper, and an area that's receiving an awful lot of attention today is perhaps that overlap between storage in terms of battery storage or potential storage in the form of hydrogen, which would link with the renewable assets across the island 
So this might require, I think, some expansion of, of, of the, the modeling uh, and certainly to look at some operational aspects. Uh, but it is, I think, an, an interesting area perhaps to consider in the future. So I think looking then in terms of the investment challenge, uh, as I said, we, we need to involve the market. We need to remove any informational problems that are out there. And we also need to be focused as the authors of this paper have been on the long-term objectives rather than the short-term outcomes. On prices and support schemes, again, been well flagged in, in the paper, the role CFDs or contracts for difference can play in supporting new renewable technologies. Well, that's the model that's been taken in Ireland, I believe it will also be the model adopted in Northern Ireland. Importantly though, in the context of current discussions and debate, CFDs don't replace the market. So we need to ensure there is a stable, functioning, well-functioning market. This research highlights that SEM, to, some, to a large extent, is doing that, certainly the wholesale market side. And that those CFD tools can be utilized uh, as, as almost a, an insurance policy for, for everybody involved. Um, but it is about accelerating the transition, and that is done through the market, uh, not by trying to sidestep the market. So again, I think we probably can get a little bogged down. One of the key results here is obviously that wholesale costs come down as a result of greater renewable investment. And one thing that is often lost when we start talking about this sort of question or this sort of issue is that that wholesale cost comes down for everybody. The policy cost is only paid to the support at megawatt hours. So even in the over, even where the bill for supporting new additional infrastructure might seem significant, it is only paid to a portion and the, the, the overall wholesale benefit is, is, is experienced by everybody. But as I sort of started these remarks in terms of what we, this challenge that's ahead of us is unprecedented. And what I'm keen to, to ensure people uh, get out of these remarks is, is that we don't, and this isn't a criticism of the paper, but that we don't try and underplay that challenge. It's not that we, from a central planner perspective, decide to do uh, two or three different things or that North South Interconnect or more storage will get us there. It is a far bigger challenge. And it is something which requires focus across, well, I suppose first uh, issues such as planning, uh, the overall grid and pace of, of grid connection, uh, and the lost energy uh, th that is out there that obviously this storage question sought to address. So in summary, al alignment brings benefits. This isn't a new phenomenon for the single electricity market. It builds on already achieved efficiencies and benefits on an all-island system that's relatively small with limited interconnection. This is a positive and perhaps explains why the effort sharing results are not as strong uh, as one may have expected at the outset. We're already doing it, is perhaps uh, the, the, the point. Storage is a no regrets option. Again, I cannot disagree with that. It's a really strong point. Uh, having recently built a 50 megawatt battery uh, in Northern Ireland, it is a challenge. But that greater level of storage will greater facilitate the delivery of onshore wind, offshore wind and solar and all of the renewables. We need to continue to push ahead with that. The North South Interconnector also makes an important contribution. And again, as I've said, for probably largely obvious reasons, uh, given the nature of the single electricity market and the costs and inefficiencies constraints add to that system. I think finally, just want to thank uh, Niall, uh, the other authors, uh, the ESRI and the Shared Island Unit uh, for funding this research. 
I think, as I said at the very outset, this is an important piece of research in reconfirming the benefits on the island of energy cooperation and alignment, the benefits we've already realized from the single electricity market and how we can continue to build on those into the future. And looking to the, looking to the future, noting the huge challenge and opportunity that is in the decarbonization. Uh, and conscious the numbers that I've quoted here today are likely to be overtaken this week uh, in a new climate action plan to be published by government. Nevertheless, it is important that we continue to push this on, that we continue to try and deliver it, and deliver it in a way that papers identified that maximizes the benefit uh, for, for customers across the island. Great. Thanks so much for that, uh, Derek. Um, I think you had a, had a great richness to the discussion this morning, so really, really do uh, appreciate it. Uh, so Muran has joined us now as well, and we have a number of questions. So again, just to uh, remind people, if they want to sub, uh, submit questions through the Q&A function, uh, they're very welcome to do so. So we've got a number of questions uh, in, and uh, I'll... I, I, not being an energy expert, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, afraid of trying to um, summarize the question, so I'll probably end up just reading them out rather than anything else. So Greg uh, Swinand uh, has, uh, has kind of clarification questions really about to, uh, to Nile and Wern. So again, let me just read it. So the figures on change in an in investment of 1% or whatever. So is that the change in the investment in generation by a value versus, I guess, a business as usual? Or is it a change in the value of the stock of generation capacity? So I suppose the percentage, yeah, it's, it's a stock flow question, uh, I guess, change in investment or a change in the stock. And then Greg has another a sort of, uh, just a clause below that, or is it uh, capacity in megawatts? So Niall, I hope you understood the question. Um, yeah, no, it's essentially it, the value. So there was change in, it's all costs, basically, is what we're looking at here. Another thing, another, yeah, so bit so Mern might might have more ideas in terms of the actual modeling nuts and bolts, but uh, we're to, we're talking in terms of in terms of costs and and uh, and euros. Uh, another question that was mentioned was why was it in in the sense of um, percentage change as opposed to euro change, and essentially that just leaves us leaves us less open sen to sensitivities about around those assumptions. So we're trying to make this as robust as possible, and that just helped us along those lines. But uh, Warren might be able to have no more details on the modeling details on that. Yeah. So in, in the paper itself, um, we pr we present all of our results as percentage changes. So kind of um, unaligned versus aligned targets. What's the what's the difference in percentage costs, whether it's generation costs, investment costs, whatever it is. Um, and in the paper, we kind of specify what the baseline is for each individual figure. Um, and as Niall said, the reason we went with percentages is to try to generalize the results because in these uncertain fuel price uh, days, the last thing you want to do is go reporting euro figures in 2030. Um, but what we can be fairly confident on is the direction and the trends, which is why everything is reported in percentage terms where possible. Um, there was another question um, at the end there, again, just a technical question, which Derek somewhat addressed around whether or not we're looking at kind of curtailed versus non-curtailed resi, ancillary services, inertia, et cetera? The answer is no. This is a least cost model where we're just minimizing the total investment and operational cost, and we're not looking at specific market revenues. But there is other research ongoing in the Institute and elsewhere looking at um, ancillary service market design and that kind of thing. OK, can I just ask a very, uh, this will sound like a very trivial non-expert question. Uh, but when we think and the way you sort of uh, developed as initially there, Niall, the idea of the island of Ireland as the single market. OK, but what is there any impact on your results, say, if the Celtic interconnector to France comes on board or presumably Northern Ireland itself could look a greater to connection with GB? OK, so I, I suppose I'm just asking that, you know, just, just the basic question about the, the original conceptualization of, of the island Do these other uh international interconnectedness uh impact on the results um yeah I, I i can take that one um so the model does assume ireland is an island isolated system so we do ignore interconnectors to gb um and future interconnectors to france 
we allow for that a little bit in making rather heroic assumptions around how much instantaneous renewable electricity we can integrate at any given time. And um, so while the model might say you can go up to 100 percent instantaneous resi penetration, and that's not realistic right now with the technology we have from the island's perspective, in reality, you could ex export some of that. So in practice, you would have some thermal generation on the system. And um, I think at these really high resi levels, excluding the interconnectors to Great Britain and to France does become um, problematic. The problem is modeling interconnected energy systems is fiendishly difficult because you're you're minimizing one objective function and the Irish system is kind of a tenth the size of the British system um, and even smaller again compared to France or, or similar compared to France and then with France you kind of have to model everyone France is interconnected to as well so when you're kind of minimizing such a ginormous objective function and Ireland's only such a teeny tiny bit of it you sort of lose confidence in your results so there's always this trade-off between accuracy within the island and accuracy within a meshed system. Okay, and just one other, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask another, and apologies if it's a naive question, but when we were doing the work on Brexit uh, a long, long time ago, this was before Brexit even happened, one of the concerns uh, that was raised was this idea that if you had a uh, divergence in um, uh, environmental policies, sort of emission, you know, climate policies uh, between, say, UK and Ireland, uh, and especially, I suppose, if, if there was any sort of sense in which, you know, in order to gain be a sort of industrial advantage or whatever like that, that you would have a, a di divergence, uh, you know, across the, that this was going to sort of put put pressure um, on on various, you know, a, a whole range of things. Again, is that a relevant consideration? What you you've been doing today, what you've been talking about? Uh, I, well, I'll just give my own thoughts on that. Um, I think one thing that would be relevant would be the sense of if we had a situation where uh, there was there was one generation in, in Ireland was subject to different types of climate policy than generations in Northern Ireland, and then you have distortions that, that you might have a really dirty generator running in one jurisdiction when because of the difference in environmental policy. I think one thing, and it sort of highlights how well there has been the coordination across the two jurisdictions is that this hasn't materialized. So, um, so yeah, so like it, it is a concern if it was let be a concern, but it, it hasn't been a concern yeah. essentially. No, no, good. As I said, it's just as we were discussing it, these these sort of issues they're yeah. uh, deep in in my brain uh, from from uh, earlier work that we were doing. Another question that comes in, kind of technical in nature, are the storage investment outcome figures for the model purely driven from curtailed stroke, not curtailed or E, or are other factors such as AS, inertia, et cetera, considered? So, so Marin mentioned that just there a minute ago. <laughs> um, uh, I think there's okay. another one. Just ah, you're right, actually. I should be looking at the one just below that. Apologies. Um, so from Conor Minogue, interesting to see the results on the effort sharing scenario. It would be interesting uh, to see this scenario modeled with emissions reduction target or even just an all energy decarbonization target transport heat electricity so that's it's 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 more a comment but either of you have a reaction to the uh, just the, the proposed research question yeah we, we've done that in some other papers um specifically on decarbonizing heat or or more on um uh, yeah kind of integrating some hydrogen into the heating system um and also looking at data centers kind of what are the impacts of data centers on the power system under renewable targets versus decarbonization targets um We've struggled to get it published because what it tends to show is that you would actually invest in a lot of CCS and uh, people, for some reason, find it hard to believe that result. Um, and we've 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 done sensitivities on the CCS investment costs and uh, people still kind of struggle to believe it. Um, I think when you if we were to rerun those scenarios with the new high fossil fuel prices we're seeing since Ukraine, that result may shift a bit because um, the last time we looked at decarbonization versus resi, it was kind of under old assumptions about fuel prices. And obviously renewables are not exposed to fossil fuel prices, whereas CCS is. Um, but I suppose on, on the substantive point, in some ways, I feel like that policy ship has sailed. Um, 
but I certainly agree that keeping decarbonization as the overall goal um, is really important in order to avoid kind of path dependency problems, kind of where we fall down a rabbit hole of something that makes sense for the next 10 years, but maybe not for the next 30 years. Um, I wonder if Derek has, has any comment on the decarbonization versus resi integration as well, kind of given that you're operating in both jurisdictions. I, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That's where the focus needs to be. Um, and one would hope that that's where the climate action plan coming out this week or next week, whenever it is, uh, starts to look in that in that direction. The targets are useful in terms of renewable electricity, and renewable electricity will, of course, be will underpin much of our decarbonisation. So it needs to be the first mover. In many ways, the electricity targets need to be hit as early or as close to 2030 as possible, so as to enable 2040 and 2050 to start to focus to, on electrification and on, on a reduction perhaps in, in overall energy use. But yeah, it, it's, it, it's where we quickly need to turn. I mean, if the electricity sector on the island is to emit something around 2 million tonnes in 2030, and in Ireland, we're emitting 10 million tonnes today, it gives you the sort of scale of problem that I described in targets or the build out of renewable, uh, but just in, in carbon terms, it is incredible. And the sooner we start to orientate policy on long-term outcomes, looking at necessary investment focused on carbon, uh, I think the better. I have a thought, um, yep. following on from, from, from Derek's uh, uh, earlier comment, and I probably might, might be an interesting question if, if you have any thoughts on it. One thing you mentioned about storage and those sort of investments was uh, the market signals, and it's a very valid point. And thinking about that in the context of the work we've done, it's more of a what we've been looking at is more of a cost reflect or cost based analysis. And in order for that to bear into reality, well, then tariffs will have to, or price signals will have to be cost reflective. And as you were saying, if there's price signals for ancillary services, those sort of things that that would um would lead into that. But another role for storage is where it comes in at moments where we have where we have less wind, and those are moments where you might have spot, you know uh, spikes in prices. Is there a is there a potential for any interaction with the current revenue cap? Is that something that's maybe on your because, for example, if if we have a, a price cap, like if we have a storage operator and it's moving in certain periods and it's relying on these periods of high prices, I my concern would be that perhaps there's a there's um interaction with the, with the revenue cap, essentially, that they're not going to get the revenues because of the cap, or maybe there's details on the revenues. I don't know, is this something that, that's on your on your radar at all? That's the hard question there, Niall, thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm only getting my head around the revenue cap right now, so trying to interact with batteries is, uh, it, it, yeah, tight. Um, so if I, if I just quickly think about so the, the lack of signals that are there today for battery, right? The, your model and any general assumption around the need for storage is a no-brainer, right? But is it going to happen? Not right now. Uh, I think most people, most utilities on the island have storage projects that they would like to develop, but we can't. So the ability, the capacity, and in some cases, the planning is all there but the signals aren't. So that's not, it, it's not going to happen. I think it's an important example between your sort of central planner investor model and the reality of what it is we're seeing on the ground. In terms of if I harvest renewables, perhaps at low prices and then release them to the grid uh, at times of high prices, do I get caught with the cap? Probably a question for the regulation. I'd have to go back in and have a quick look. I'm not sure it's a capture technology, but, um, under under the require under the regulation, but uh, it does also point to another question. I mean, around uh, the arbitrage opportunity that should probably exist that might improve. I know there is some movements in that direction today uh, now, but up to now, it's not been possible to arbitrage a battery on the system, right? And that's uh, inconsistent with most other countries where where batteries are being produced. 
I think the other question you have, an interesting one on, on batteries, is how do we incentivize more longer term storage in Ireland? And that's back to sort of my marginal investment question with very large pieces of kit and infrastructure. We're a small system and longer duration, I'm not talking four hours, I'm talking much longer, um, will be required probably to help us through what uh, I know described in, in the electricity sector at the moment as the Dunkel flight. But, um, it, that's going to be a reality that we, we transition through over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Derek. And uh, th thanks for a very good question, uh, Niall. This was the uh, true spirit of, of these things. We should be uh, asking as many questions as we're answering uh, to ensure that the, uh, the, the supply of research questions is always there. And uh, we're we're waiting to bounce. So listen, it's it's it, it's midday, and uh, we we only want to take an hour uh, of people's time. So I'm going to draw things to a close. Uh, so uh, a few thank yous. First, thanks to Niall and Murren uh, for a, an excellent report and uh, interesting presentation. Thanks very much to you too, Derek, uh, for coming along. Very much enjoyed your. Uh, contribution. Uh, I want to thank the Shared Island Unit uh, for their ongoing uh, support of, of this programme and engagement uh, with us. The uh, the research papers are now really, really building up and I think our, our knowledge uh, as a result then of, of these all-island issues across a whole range of domains is really developing and I think that is uh, very worthwhile. Uh, finally, thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in anyway this morning. Um, probably possibly anyway our last uh, webinar before Christmas so just want to wish everybody the best for Christmas and uh, say we look forward to seeing you uh, in 2023 partly online uh, but I think increasingly in person as well so anyway thanks to everybody uh, and good morning enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>